Hello and welcome each and every one of you. With you today is May Daiga, Most Linguistic International Coach Therapist from DCT Center. And today I am presenting to you the eight concepts from Course in Miracles by Morgan Rain. Journey without distance, the place we never left. Reality versus illusion. Please remember if you or your family or friends are interested in personal ter therapy and healing, you can reach out to me or to Morgan for private sessions. All contact details are in the description below the video. If you like what I do, please like, share and subscribe to my YouTube and Rumble channels. Enjoy the course and God bless. So let's just begin by moving our awareness within. We could so easily do that by just taking a conscious breath. And releasing and letting it go and just allow ourselves to relax into the space where we are. Bringing our awareness and our attention to this present moment. To this time that we've agreed to gather together to awaken and remember the truth of who we are. And so with open eyes, open minds, open hearts, we begin our journey together again this day as we begin to look at what is reality and what is illusion. And as we traverse this concept, I ask that what is needing to be released and let go this day is done so easily and effortlessly. And that which is to be remembered, may it be integrated within our minds, our hearts, our actions. And so in love and light, we begin our day together, open hearted, open minded, open eyed as to the truth of spirit and what spirit would like for us to know today. And so it is. Well, this is A Course in Miracles. Please take notes. These are the 12 primary concepts. I can't believe we're already on class eight. Um, um, I think I start getting FOMO about here <laughs> where it's like, oh, no, there's only this many to go. But um, we're here right now, and that's just trying to keep me in the present moment. So we've been through bliss and oneness versus separation. And bliss and oneness is actually where we want to go back to. We've looked at forgiveness versus judgment, love versus fear, innocence versus guilt and shame, God's Holy Spirit versus the ego, responsibility versus projection, right-mindedness versus wrong-mindedness, and today, reality versus illusion. The concept reality versus illusion is a pivotal one because it's our last stop before we enter the material world. Everything up to this point occurred only in our mind, but now, although it's still occurring only in our mind, it will soon appear to take form. The manifestation of our thoughts of separation now become the evidence that we, that what we had thought in our minds is now becoming a reality. And it seems too late to remedy. So we metaphorically bought our ticket, passport, visa, and even applied for citizenship which was granted by our ego, and it seems as though there is no way home. All of this became true for us only because we chose to listen to the voice of our ego and believe in the ego's illusionary story. However, we can always choose again. That's my 
favorite concept <laughs> in all of Course in Miracles, we can always choose again. It's not really a choice between two options, reality versus illusion, because one option is true and the other is not. So we really can choose only one of these seeming options. We cannot choose illusion since it isn't real, but we can certainly keep trying to choose the unreal. The problem with such a decision, however, is that it's always a painful experience to keep trying to choose something that isn't true and isn't really there. As we walk through this illusory material world, even if we are not consciously aware of it, there is always a center path towards home, our true reality that runs down the middle of all our detours into illusion. Everything of the dream world is a detour from reality and is not the center path for God. The consciousness of God is the center path in the center of our true being. God calls us to the center every second of every minute of every day. However, if we are listening mentally to the distracting voices arising from our ego, we can easily miss or misinterpret the voice of God emanating from the center. The choices we make along this journey will determine whether we are building a consciousness and an experience of reality or illusions. When we choose that which reflects God reality, we are accessing the right mind. When we choose that which reflects our ego's reality, we are accessing our wrong mind. Whichever we experience it is always our choice, consciously or unconsciously. The concept of illusion includes our being in denial over some of the unfortunate decisions we have made previously. However, denial does not help. It only prolongs the experience of illusion. Denial and illusion tend to create internal conflict which contributes to a perception of duality between all things, including reality and illusion. So denial begets its own likeness and being. The illusion of duality does not include a polarity between God's spirit and matter form, even though it may seem that way. What could be an opposite of God's spirit which is all that is? The answer is nothing, because in truth, nothing is nothing, not an opposite of something. The material world can reflect either heaven or hell, God or the ego, for it is a mirror and a reflection of our consciousness. So we need to keep the mirror, our perceptions of the material world, clean and clear of all the darkness we have projected or reflected onto it. We keep the mirror clean by keeping our mind and consciousness, which the mirror reflects, free of darkness. The resulting reflection of holiness draws others towards the divine plan or the path of God where they can leave all ego distractions behind. The light of God is pure and clear. So if we keep the mirror of our mind clear, we reflect the pure light of God we can see in this world, a more perfect spiritual reflection of God's light. And even though this world is only a reflection of our purified mind, it's not yet the pure experience of oneness with God. By doing our part to clear the images in the mirror of our mind, we shift from living on the left side of the bridge 
to living on the right side, creating a temporary state of heaven on earth. One day, all the mirrors will disappear and we will release even this temporary version of heaven and be completely reabsorbed back into heaven, the consciousness of God found at the top of the pyramid. And I really like the little images I put here on the left and the right of the, of the pyramid with the wrong mind and um, all the darkness that that might be and the, the monsters and the scary things. And there's that beautiful bridge. If we get onto that bridge and practice self-forgiveness and awakening and uh, becoming aware, we can move over to that right side so that the mirror that we're looking is, is a child of God, our innocence, uh, the preciousness of who we are, rather than on the left side of the bridge where um, the um, darkness of what we believe we are exists. So the, the, the test for us now is to get over to the right side and remember, begin to remember and awaken to who we are, that we are all children of the divine. We are all innocent. And in staying there, then we can move that veil of illusion and move into oneness and bliss. And we won't need a, a mirror to reflect back to us. We will know within ourselves. One of the natural effects of being asleep is that of dreaming. Well, there are two forms of dreams in dreaming. There's negative dreaming, which we call nightmares. And there's positive dreaming, which we call happy dreams. Carl Jung says, who looks outside dreams, who looks inside awakens. And I love that because that, that really sums it all up right there. If we're looking outside of ourselves, we are participating in the dream world. But when we look inside of ourselves, we begin to awaken. <laughs> Negative dreaming, which includes not consciously remembering our dreams, includes dreams that reflect the pain, longing, and frustrations of not being connected to God. Positive dreaming includes dreams that encourage, inspire, and reflect our progress of connecting to God. Again, all dreams are either telling us of the pain of being asleep or the relief that comes from awakening. We are even dreaming when we are awake. So it doesn't matter if our dreams are daytime dreams or nightmare dreams. In either case, the visual representations we perceive in our dreams are usually just negative projections from our disempowered minds that have not gone to sleep and dreamt that we are something that we are not and that we are somewhere that we are not all sleeping dream images including those of other people are usually just aspects of ourselves the more often we interpret our dreams as such the more accurate our dream interpretations will be Conversely, the more often we take dreams literally to be about the people appearing in our dreams and in our lives, the more inaccurate our dream interpretations will be. But wait, which dreams are we trying to end? The daytime or the nighttime dreams? Well, actually, we want to end both. We want to wake from the dream state. Upside down world. A Course in Miracles tells us that even though we seem to have separated from God, the evidence in the material world supporting such a belief is merely a symbol in the dream. And just as dreams seem real to the dreamer, this material world seems real to us. But in truth, no matter where dreamers seem to be in their dreams, they are not actually in the location of the dream. They are just dreaming and are still at home, safely tucked in bed. 
while they sleep, dreamers can either have pleasant dreams or nightmares. And in our case, God not only wants us to awaken from our nightmares, but also to awaken from all dreams and be completely awake in heaven. While we appear to be here, just reminding ourselves that this is all an illusion will help us to cope with the world, including the harms we have done and the harms done to us. However, this does not mean that we have free license to do as we please because it's all just an illusion and it doesn't matter. Well, it does matter within the dream because if we do something hurtful, even though it's ultimately an illusion, we and others will seem to suffer from illusory karmic consequences and pain. So until the day we choose to awaken from this holographic dream of separation, that which is an illusion will seem real to us. And that which is real will seem like a mere theory or a dream. In other words, the entire universe will appear upside down. Illusion seeming to be real and reality seeming to be false. Although most people don't know it, this was the actual reason the Apostle Peter asked to be crucified upside down. He was making a statement that the early Christian Gnostics understood. This world is a reverse reality. So in being crucified upside down, the Apostle Peter was making a statement that death and crucifixion are all of this upside down world and are not part of God's world. This is probably my second favorite saying in Course in Miracles. Know the truth, but respect the illusion. Instead of totally negating the power of this illusory world, we are better off knowing the truth but respecting the illusion. This means that even though in truth this world is not real and does not have power over us, if we identify with the physical body, a, signif a significant part of us still believes in the power of this illusion. And we should try, therefore, to honor our human issues and our needs. That is why Christ in A Course in Miracles with compassion and patience teaches us that although the world in our human bodies is not real, we should still take an aspirin when we have a headache. This is like what Jesus meant when he suggested in the Bible that we give to Caesar the world and the body which is Caesar's and give to God that which is God's. In other words, if we keep our priorities straight, we can meet the human needs without losing sight of the ability to heal the mind of our best perceptions that's feeding our body as well as our soul. This is why when reading A Course in Miracles or any other teachings of Christ consciousness, it's important to remember that Christ teaches on two levels, teaching the truth of God and respecting our current level of awareness. Students who do not know about these two levels of teaching or sometimes failed to understand what they are attempting to learn. For example, they might find that the curriculum seems contradictory when in fact it isn't. It's just that we are being taught on these two levels, the level of what is spiritually true and the level of what only seems to be the human experience. And I'm going to tell you this little story about uh, a woman who took a workshop on Christ consciousness. She wrote, I had a vision of Jesus last night where I saw myself in the same position as the apostles when they were at the boat being overtaken by waves. And like the apostles, I saw what seemed to be a ghost out on the water, but eventually I realized it was Jesus. 
He called out to me and told me to step out onto the water. So I did as he asked, but I sank to the bottom of the lake. The next thing I know, I'm at the bottom and I saw Jesus approaching me from off in the distance. When he approached, I asked him what he was doing down there with me. He replied by saying, I will always meet you at whatever level you are at. The moral of the dream story is the God, that God loves us and wants us to know that it doesn't matter who we believe we are or where we have been or where we seem to be presently. We will always be asked to step forward to face our lessons related to faith and trust. But even if we seem to fail at such tasks, we always will be met by God and true teachers of God at the level we are at. We are all living out one of two primary types of mythology, the myth of being asleep and the myth of awakening. <clears throat> The experience of being awake would not be a myth, so we only have the myth of being asleep and the myth of awakening, and sometimes a mixture of both myths. The myths and stories of being asleep, as manifested in our personal lives, are the stories of our harming others or being harmed by others. These are the stories of our being powerless victims or of being victimizers. Such stories, myths, often end up with us seeming to fail life's tests and having to repeat them. The myths and stories of awakening are the stories of our being on the healing path and the spiritual path. These are the stories of our healing and making better choices and being the heroes who pass their tests and initiations. The ultimate mythology, mythological story would be though, well, once upon a time and forever shall it be, there was God, the eternal embodiment of love, peace, joy, and absolute bliss. And one day God and its infinite love decided to extend itself and expand its love by creating more of itself. So God created its holy child, the Christ that we all are. And they lived happily ever after the end. <laughs> but again, instead of this being the only story that defines our existence, we have created two primary types of mythology myths relating to our sleeping, and myths related to our awakening. Sleep is a strange process that few people really understand, especially since it can be studied as both a literal and or metaphoric process. But understanding the sleeping and dreaming process is crucial to understanding life itself. This means that even though most of us are used to referring to our experience of dreaming while we sleep at night, we also need to realize that we are asleep and dreaming during the day as well, even though we appear to be awake. Edgar Allan Poe, quote, all of life is but a dream within a dream. In other words, whether we are talking about daytime or nighttime, we are always spiritually sleeping until we are spiritually awake. And just as it is dangerous to sleepwalk and go about our daily routine while we are technically asleep, so too is it dangerous to go about our lives while we are spiritually asleep. Sleep is just a second world wherein we continue to fulfill our purpose of learning and teaching, albeit in our astral body while our physical body lives in our bed. In the morning when we awaken, we should ask ourselves how we feel 
as this will be the evidence of what we did in our sleep time. Did we spend our sleep time merely recovering from our day-to-day egotistic life? If so, we will probably wake up feeling tired, spent, and with little or no inspiration. If, on the other hand, we practice surrendering our sleep time to God, possibly by affirming, I rest in God, then we will probably wake up feeling alive and inspired. One important similarity between our daytime and nighttime sleep is that during both, we have the option of having either happy dreams or nightmares. The goal of both forgiveness and the development of Christ consciousness, however, is for us to awaken from either type of sleep, dreams, or nightmares, because both are still dreams. Even though our happy dreams, day or night, seem the most pleasant. Course in Miracles quote, how you are awake is the sign of how well you have used sleep. Whenever you wake dispiritedly, your sleep was not given to the Holy Spirit. You can indeed be drugged by sleep if you have misused it. Only when you awaken joyously have you utilized sleep according to his purpose. I love this little graphic here. We exist for each other as mirrors. Just kind of sit in with that. We exist for each other as mirrors. Whenever we discuss the dreamt up images of people in our lives, we are almost never accurately seeing them, nor their perceived and projected behaviors. Whatever unresolved issues we have within ourselves or are attempting to project onto others are boomeranging back to us as dream symbols day or night. Since most dreams and perception are on a negative level, we should work to evolve away from negative dreaming and into positive dreaming. This is similar to shifting from my wrong-mindedness, ego-based consciousness to our right-mindedness, soul-based consciousness. In other words, as we shift from having typical, sometimes nonsensical dream images, we begin receiving clear guidance and direct revelations from God. In fact, that's precisely what positive dreams are all about. They are the Holy Spirit's attempt to wake us up by sending us messages of love and comfort, urging us to gently open our eyes and recognize the truth that we are merely sleeping and are now at home, safe and sound. God says, my children are asleep and must be awakened. How can you wake up? children in a kindlier way than by a gentle voice that will not frighten them, but will merely remind them that the night is over and the light has come. You merely train them that they are safe now. Then you train them to recognize the difference between sleeping and waking so that they need not be afraid of dreams. And so when bad dreams come, they will themselves call on the light to dispel them. The only reason we dream is because our human experience reflects our soul's experience, and our soul is dreaming. Our human self, therefore, dreams as well. In our dreams, we are a human being with a body. We experience gravity, limitation, sickness, and or death. During these dreams, we also experience friends, enemies, pleasures, and pains. We seek approval and live to supply our limited self with its various needs. 
we perceive all the people in our lives, which are just figures in our dream, as real. Their status as real is confirmed every time we react to them for good or ill. When we cease reacting to people and events as though they were real, we will begin to wake up and become free from the illusions of our waking dreams. This is why Buddha encouraged us to get off the proverbial hamster wheel, meaning to stop reacting to life stuff. And since he himself accomplished this, he was then awake. In A Course in Miracles, Jesus draws a parallel between our awakening and our need to laugh at the absurdity of the idea of our being separate from God or our tendency to take such a concept seriously when we should, in fact, just laugh. In gentle laughter does the Holy Spirit perceive this cause and look not to its effects. How else could he correct your error who has overlooked the cause entirely? He bids you bring each terrible effect to him that you may look together on its foolish cause and laugh with him a while. You judge effects, but he has judged their cause. And by his judgment are effects removed. I love this piece of work by Rumi. It's called The Guest House. And <clears throat> it, it just so um, poignantly uh, reflects what it's like in the waking up in the dream, waking up to what's real. So just bring this uh, poem inside and, and think about yourself as I read this poem to you. It's by Rumi and it's called The Guest House. This being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness, some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all, even if they are a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture. Still, treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice. Meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whatever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. Just as being asleep has the effect of giving us dreams and nightmares, so too does awakening have an effect. But the effect of starting to awaken is more like lucid dreaming, wherein we are dreaming, but we are aware of where we are and that we are capable of altering the outcomes of our experiences. And just as we can accomplish this in our sleep, so too can we accomplish this in our waking life. It's like in the, the poem I just read, all these things can come, but greet them at the door laughing, um, that begins immediately to shift our perception of the illusion into a reality. In the Course in Miracles, it says, to open the eyes of the blind is the Holy Spirit's mission. For the Holy Spirit would awaken them from the sleep of forgetting to the remembering of God. This world of form is a holographic dream. We are literally dreaming that we are going to work, entering into relationships, having babies, growing old, dying and coming back to life. 
yet again and again in another body. And the world will never encourage us to wonder if this is a seeming experience is real. In other words, the dreamer begins to awaken, but also needs to resist the temptation to press the snooze button. This metaphor of pressing the snooze button is akin to our need to get on the path and then become easily detoured. The most common detour of all, however, is the temptation to focus too much on the outer world of illusion and not enough attention on the inner world of reality. You are a child of God and only this is real. You have chosen sleep in which you have had bad dreams, but the sleep, it's not real. And God calls you to awake. Your dreams have confused you, yet that was only because you were asleep and did not know when you wake, you will see the truth around you and you will no longer believe in dreams. Since only the inner world is real, focusing on the outer world automatically induces a sleep-like state. But when we consistently choose being awake, reality, over being asleep, illusion, we begin to see not only the holiness of the real world and all its inhabitants, but we also see all the holy things we created, even when we thought we were asleep. Okay, so this is a random picture of a dog, <laughs> white dog with a beautiful aura all around it. And you'll see it also has its third eye intact. I included this because um, uh, it was sometime about a year and year and a half or so ago that uh, I'd been working with lucid dreaming and, um, and really practicing uh, surrendering my sleep time to God and asking questions before I would go to sleep that I would uh, expect that I would get answers to. One of those questions uh, this one night as I was uh, preparing for my sleep time, I was asking what is the correct relationship to have with the Christ? It was a question that even though I've had relationship with the Christ, I wanted to know what God's correct relationship with Christ was. And so I went to bed. <laughs> and as I was waking up from, I was realizing I was dreaming. And the dream I had was myself in, a, you know, a, a beautiful dreamlike meadow, as we can, we can uh, conjure up in our dreams. And beside me was a white dog that was on my right side. And I think that was significant <laughs> to have the dog on my right side. And this dog was like with me. There was not like a separation between me and the dog. When I moved, the dog moved. When I ran, the dog ran. When I jumped, the dog would jump. And it was just this beautiful, seamless movement of me and this dog um, living and experiencing life and having joy. And, and I realized I was in the dream and began it, uh, rather than just letting the dream in, I stepped into the dream consciously and um, was playing around with how to move with this, this dog. And um, I was having so much fun and I felt so connected. And um, I knew that my body was trying to wake up. My earth body was trying to wake up. And before I left the dream, I looked right at the dog, right into its face and said, what's your name? And the dog answers me back, I am Christos. 
So I moved out of the dream and I kept hearing, I am Christos, I am Christos. And the image of me and the dog moving and living and experience life as one was the beautiful message that I got back from that dream from God um, that the correct relationship with the Christ <laughs> is just like that as it was with this dog named Christos, which was live, move, and have your being in this awareness at all times, that it's always there, it's always present, and to act as though and believe as though that's true. And so I included this image to remind me to um, tell about the dream and how to use um, the the uh, dream interpretations in in a way that allows you to take that information and utilize it in your life. And you can get that from lucid dreaming. So it's a beautiful practice. So this is an exercise that we'll be doing during the week. And of course, it's around lucid dreaming. <laughs> um, Various tribes of indigenous people throughout the earth referred to the world we perceive as the world that we have dreamed into being. And not only do we dream the world of our waking life into being, so too we dream our sleep time dreams into being in the same way. Both two dream worlds are created by the same being and in the same way they are created by us through our thoughts and our beliefs. Therefore, many indigenous people raise their children to practice lucid dreaming, which is a technique wherein we, the dreamer, recognize that we are dreaming and consequently can choose to change the outcome of the dream. In lucid dreaming, we are awake within our dream and know we are dreaming. And I'll pause there. That's just like it was for me in the dream as I was realizing I was dreaming, but I was really sleeping, but I was aware enough to move into the dream consciously. And, and when we do this, we immediately shift from being helpless victims to becoming choice makers in our dreams and therefore in our waking life. The following steps can assist nearly everyone to become a more conscious dreamer, thus creating a happy dream. Okay, so I'm going to read the exercise, and of course, I'll send these to you for your practices during the week. Actually, making lucid dreaming not just a practice for this week, lucid dreaming is so powerful, and you can work out so much stuff within lucid dreaming. And I will say, it's not just about those nighttime dreams. You can practice lucid dreaming whenever you move into like a thought pattern that's disturbing and like you can conjure up images and your heart can race and, and all you're doing is thinking a thought, well, that's a dream. And in there, you can also practice lucid dreaming. All right, so the steps for doing this are one, before going to sleep at night, invite the Holy Spirit to be your teacher, guide, and healer. Number two, after your prayer and as you begin to drift into sleep, repeat a verbal suggestion to yourself as follows. As I sleep and dream, I will wake up in my dreams and recognize that I am dreaming. Number three, anytime you are sleeping and realize that you were dreaming by awakening while still in the dream, notice what is happening in the dream. If you were being shown a negative situation or outcome, try playing with the outcome, creating different options and choosing one that feels positive. If possible, 
ask the Holy Spirit to help you make this decision. When you awaken from sleeping and dreaming, take a moment to realize that any success in changing the outcome of your sleeping dreams also applies to your ability to change the outcome of your daily experiences and in fact has already begun to do so. Number five, prayerfully give thanks that you are choosing to become a co-creator with God as God has always intended. So those are the five steps for developing lucid dreaming. And we're going to just take a moment and um, do just a little brief exercise. So I invite you all to just kind of let go for the moment and move into and remember either a dream that you had during a sleep state or a waking thought dream like I was just talking about before where we have a thought maybe it's a recurring thought and that you can you can literally image and make up and dream, dream into your present moment something that's not even really happening but it, it becomes a dream and so I invite you to choose either one a dream that you've had or a dream that you create through a thought process. And I'll just give you a moment to just choose one. And it's a dream that you maybe would like to change or a thought process you'd like to change. And as we begin this, we're just gonna invite the Holy Spirit into this. Just invite the Holy Spirit to be your teacher, your guide through this process of remembering the dream or remembering the dream thought. And in asking the Holy Spirit to be your teacher and guide through this, just relax knowing that your answers will come. And as you look at this dream, look at the dream like it's on a screen in front of you, seeing the dream play itself out or the thought process playing itself out with all the images and feelings. And as you are looking at this on the screen, notice what's coming up for you. What are you feeling? Are there fears coming up? What are those fears? And as you're looking at that dream as just an image on a screen, make a decision to bring the awareness of your real self, your true self, your divine self into the dream. Step into the, the screen and witness it from being in the dream. <clears throat> Allow yourself as the witness and as a participant now in the dream to move in the dream and make changes. What would you change? What is the Holy Spirit guiding you to change? And as you make the changes within the dream, how are you feeling? What's happening now? What are you knowing about yourself within this dream?
And now step outside of the dream and just witness it as the screen again. And watch the dream as just an observer outside of it. How that dream plays out. Ask yourself, what do I know more about myself now? What have I learned from this experience? And then just let the screen go away and come back within your own being as into your heart and notice how you feel. Do you feel at peace? Do you feel agitated? What do you feel? Just be honest with that. How do I feel? If you want and need continued guidance, ask for it right now. Ask for that guidance during the day while you are awake. Work to stay within your heart as you navigate your days. Take a breath in. And allow yourself to just give thanks now. Thanks that you're becoming a co-creator with God. This is what God has always intended, that we are co-creators with God. Co-creating your life. Co-creating the dreams to be happy dreams and eventually be the dream that all dreams fall away and that we move into the conscious state of heaven, bliss, love, joy, light. Take a breath in. And just release that breath as together we release and let go all that does not belong to us anymore with ease and with effortlessness. And we take the beautiful teachings and lessons, ahas and realizations that Spirit has given us this day. We allow that to integrate within our minds and our hearts, our beings and our actions in our world. And so it is. This is the end of class eight, the concept of reality versus illusion. Allow yourself time to practice the exercise for developing lucid dreaming, both when you're asleep and in your awake state. Do that for this week.